So raise your hand if you've ever wondered, is there a more fair way to value Bitcoin? Because recently during this long bear market, many people have been increasingly wondering if there's a better way to determine how much a Bitcoin should actually be worth besides all the rampant speculation going on. So in this video, I'm going to share with you three different ways from which we can better value Bitcoin. And we did spend a ton of time doing this research and breaking it down into an easily understandable form. So if you're interested in this topic, then just keep on watching. Hi everyone, I'm Kevin from Bitcoin for Beginners and welcome back to another episode of my ongoing series called Kevin Talks Crypto. In this series, I'm going to pick out topics that are interesting to me, do a lot of research and share with you my findings. So if you find this video informative at all, then please support me by smashing that like button and clicking subscribe down below as well. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so first and foremost, why do we want to look at value? Well, because we can tell if an asset is over or underpriced, and that could be used to gauge price direction, right? If it's overpriced, it might go down. If it's underpriced, it might go up. For example, for different types of assets for real estate, you can consider the location, materials, age, regional market to get a better sense of what's a fair value for a particular piece of property. For stocks, you can look at the industry it's in, company assets, quarterly results, and so forth. And then we have commodities like gold and silver, that are a little bit harder to peg down its value because they don't have any income producing assets or anything underlying it. They're the assets in and of itself and it's primarily a store of value. So the price can really only be pegged to supply and demand, but their perceived value is based on thousands of years of price discovery because gold and silver have been around for a long, long time. What about Bitcoin though? It's a new and unique asset class, kind of like gold because it doesn't have any physical use cases, revenue streams, or balance sheets. It can be used as a store of value, but also Bitcoin is is intrinsically tied to its unique blockchain network. And then if we think about securities or stocks, these have been around for hundreds of years. Gold and silver has been around for thousands of years. So they have a lot of data and studies to create better metrics and valuation models for these types of assets. Bitcoin's only been around for nine years. So this is a really, really early stage in terms of developing financial models for this type of asset. However, there are several ongoing efforts to create valuation methods for Bitcoin, and this can hopefully help us with better analyzing price. Let's take a look at some. Just an overview of what I'm going to cover today. We're going to take a look at Bitcoin's value based on its adoption and network effect, its production costs by mining, its market size as a currency, and also kind of discuss how TA fits into this whole picture. Okay, so number one, Bitcoin's value is based on its network adoption. And the most famous one that you may have heard of is Metcalf's law. Basically what it says is that all networks, whether it be telecom, social, or payment networks, get more valuable the more connected users there are. Think about it, it pretty much makes sense. And Bitcoin's network is very similar to those three. What Metcalf's law says is that the effect of the network is N squared. And this works in real life. If you take a look at Facebook's revenue and map it to its number of users, it follows the N squared model pretty closely closely. Let's try applying this model to Bitcoin. But before that, we have to talk about what N would be. There's a lot of choices, right? You can take the number of users using the network, the number of devices connected, the number of full nodes, number of wallet addresses. They're all a little bit different. And also you can ask the question for each of those, should they be unique or active perhaps? In our opinion, the best choice is to take N as the number of full plus light nodes. But this may be a hard number to pin down exactly. And the best analysis from research out there comes from taking n equals the number of addresses. So Tom Lee's method is based on this Metcalf's law. And what he does is that he takes the value of Bitcoin's network to be n squared times the average transaction value going on in the network. According to him, this has explained 94% of Bitcoin's price movement in the past four years, a really high and accurate number in my opinion. And this also just makes sense to me, right? Basically he's saying that the value of Bitcoin's network depends on the number of users and how much they're transacting. And this can also be used to predict future Bitcoin prices based on the projected adoption rates for the network. So I'm not going to do all the calculations in this video, but if you go to the blockchain website and scroll down, they have all this detailed information. Like I just showed a screenshot. It has network activity. You can get the number of transactions. You can get the average transaction value. It's all there open because it's a blockchain. And so you can go do those calculations and projections yourself. Another one similar to the Tom Lee's method is network value to transaction 
transaction ratio. This was created by Willy Wu. You can see him on the right hand side on Twitter. His handle is at WooNomic. And it's similar to a P and E ratio or price and earnings ratio for stocks if you guys are familiar with the traditional markets. Basically, the NVT ratio is you take market cap divided by total number of transactions. What can this ratio tell us? Well, it can tell us how far the market cap is kind of stretching away from the actual value being used and transacted on its network. So the ratio can be particularly useful to analyze price corrections, right? Because when the price drops, we can ask ourselves, is it just a consolidation or a full blown crash? And this ratio, depending on how much the market cap has stretched away from the actual value on the network can tell us a lot about that. So this is one screenshot I got. And basically it shows the NVT ratio down below in bold. And when it's above the normal range between the two lines, it's most likely a crash and it's gonna go down a lot. Whereas if it's within that range and it goes down, then it might just be a consolidation. Here's a more updated one that includes the first part of 2018. And it also shows that these corrections are more like a full blown crash as we all know now that it's true. And I didn't know this before, but this is really fascinating. If the NVT is such a great signal, it might tell us when to hodl and when to sell, right? Next up is also pretty similar to Metcalf's law. It's a logarithmic regression model. This was posted and introduced on the Bitcoin talk forums in 2014, quite a while ago, and basically a model Bitcoin's adoption as a log regression. So basically it says that Bitcoin's adoption is based on the growth of users, and that is determined by the number of new addresses coming in. And a log regression makes sense for those of you who don't know. Basically what it does is that it says the percentage growth decreases as time goes on. So it starts out really rapidly in terms of percentage growth, and and then studies off, which is definitely true if you think about it, because when you go from like one person to two person, that's a huge percentage gain. But when you go from like 11 million to 12 million, that's not as big of a gain percentage wise. So the price predictions based on the model is on the table to the right. And basically it says that $1,000 per Bitcoin in April 24th, 2015, 10K in November 22nd, 2017, 100K in 2021, and 1 million in 2026. Will this be right? I don't know, but I hope so because I'm holding on to Bitcoin and if it's a million, I'll be so happy. But they also overlaid the actual price on top of that curve. And this has come up with some really interesting insights. Here's a picture that I got from Reddit. It's by Marf9 posted eight months ago. Basically, they overlaid the price. You could just focus on the purple curve for now. But what's really fascinating is that they were behind and ahead on certain projections. But the projection of 10K in November 2017 was only a few days off. And remember, they released this model four years ago. So was it just a crazy coincidence? Or are they maybe onto something with this log regression? model. The second way to value Bitcoin is to take a look at the production or mining costs. And mining costs actually matter if you think about it because it's an influence on price because Bitcoin needs to be an economically viable asset. Just like gold miners, right? They're not going to keep on mining gold unless they can make enough to cover the cost of the operations and preferably make a profit too. But the thing with Bitcoin mining is that it differs worldwide drastically, right? The price of electricity is different, equipment, operations, so forth. It's hard to get a reliable number for cost to use, but but let's assume for a second that we can. The first way to use this is via a simple multiplier. And that's to take the value of Bitcoin is equal to 3x the cost of mining, which is the most common multiplier used. It's random, I know, but it can potentially be used as a max reasonable price for Bitcoin based on its production costs. Now, it would be weird if Bitcoin's value is solely dependent on its mining cost. But if you think about it, mining can also be correlated to network adoption, which is the first thing that we mentioned. Because more adoption equals higher price equals more miners joined to earn Bitcoin equals the more resources needed to compete equals higher mining cost. Another way to look at mining costs is net present cost. What this does is that it compares the total cost it takes to mine to simply investing in Bitcoin and it calculates the break even point. The theory says that Bitcoin should fluctuate back towards its equilibrium point because if the price goes above the net present cost, then you can get Bitcoin for cheaper by mining. In that case, more miners will join, the cost of mining increases to mine the same amount of Bitcoin, and then thus the net present cost increases back to the open Open markets price. On the other hand, if the price is under the net present cost, buying on exchange is cheaper. So that means there will be more demand on exchanges and price increases back to net present cost. Another way to look at this mining cost as Bitcoin value is to take the average cost as price bottom. This is a popular theory during this current 2018 bear market, and it takes the average cost of mining as support for Bitcoin's price. As you may remember, Bitcoin's price has bounced off the roughly 6K level several times already, and the theory goes that this is the average cost for Bitcoin mining worldwide, and that usually miners sell their Bitcoins to cover operational costs, right? But now they don't want to sell at a loss, so instead they hold and wait for it to go up. So this reduces the supply of Bitcoin hitting the markets and selling pressure decreases as well. So the price steadies at that level. Now this makes a lot of sense to me, but unfortunately there's not a lot of evidence out there to 
kind of support this theory. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see on how true this holds. Last but not least, number three is Bitcoin's value based on currency market size. So basically this takes Bitcoin as a currency and we use the famous economic theory MV equals PT or the quantity theory of money. And what each of these variables stand for is M equals the money supply and there's a lot of different types M0 through M4. And if you go up from M0 to M1 to M2, etc., you'll include more and more types of currency like deposits, savings, money funds, and more. But the bottom levels is like the cash you have on hand ready to spend. V is the velocity of money and this says how many times does a currency unit change hands on average. P is the price level of goods and services and T is the number of transactions performed for these goods and services. So let's talk just a little bit more of this to get this more clear in your head. M is all the money of a certain type that's been brought into circulation. Times V is the number of times a unit of money is spent on stuff in a given period. And this is equal to P, which is the average level of prices for some set of goods and services, times T, which is the number of goods and services that were bought and sold during that time period, which makes sense, right? Like average level of prices times the amount of stuff that you bought and sold is equal to the money that's out in circulation times the number of times it's been traded hands or exchanged because if you're exchanging stuff, you're using it for goods and services. So the first and most popular way to look at this for Bitcoin is for its use as a tender for illegal drugs trade, because the theory is that the base value of Bitcoin derives from the drugs market. Bitcoin is always going to be useful for buying illegal drugs with. Just like fiat money will always be useful to pay government taxes with because the government makes fiat and they'll always accept it. So using MV equals PT with some common assumptions, you got M equals 21 million, which we assume is a long-term supply of Bitcoin. V equals 10. This is velocity based on the short-term cash that we're assuming for this. Global drugs trades, 426 to 652 billion per UN report. And P equals Bitcoin's dollar value. So do the math, it puts Bitcoin price at roughly 2000 to 3000 dollars. But there's some problems with this approach though. Velocity can change, like M1 for USD has fluctuated between 5 and 9 in the past few years. And the velocity of drug money may also be different and constantly changing. Now Bitcoin can also be used as a store of value. So velocity based on its use as short term currency seems flawed in my opinion. Also, what if Bitcoins was used for the whole illicit trades market and not just limited to the drugs trade? That would put its price at roughly 7000 to $10,000. But also this only tells you how much Bitcoin should be worth if it were to be the currency for the drugs trade. And if you think about it, this, this is not the same as calculating a fair value because it has a lot more usages than just that. Just for fun, what if Bitcoin replaced all fiat currency? Like some people want it to be the one world currency. You've seen people say that before. So then we would use money supply type M2 for velocity. So M is at 21 million, V is at 1.5, kind of similar to M2 for USD. T is at 90 trillion, which is the gross world product estimate. And do the math, you get roughly $2,800,000 per Bitcoin. This could be used as a theoretical price ceiling for Bitcoin. It would never really go higher than this. And so what if BTC is a store of value instead? The assumption is that the total value of all Bitcoin could equal the total value of all gold mined. In 2017, that was $7.5 trillion. And if it stays steady at that level, then the price of one Bitcoin would be that number divided by 21 million and get us roughly $350,000 per Bitcoin. Just a fun exercise, but also a good value for Bitcoin in my opinion. So for those of you who are wondering, how does TA fit into this picture, right? When we're talking about fair value of Bitcoin. Well, in terms of technical analysis, let's just ignore the concept of fair value for a second. Bitcoin at the end of the day is worth what people think it's worth based on supply and demand. And this depends on where they think it's headed based on research or news or information coming out. So technical chart analysis is based on this idea that the market prices take into account all the info out there and the price changes when the info changes. So they say that it's fruitless to measure fair value. Instead, just look at the charts for where the direction is headed. And so for technical analysis, you see people use like resistance, support, moving averages, candlesticks, and other indicators. Definitely an interesting take and the other side of the table compared to fundamental analysis or fair value, but definitely something to keep in mind for context. Okay, everybody, phew, that was a long video, but hopefully very informative. We did a ton of research for this, if you can't tell. I hope you learned a ton and can take something away with you. If you liked it, please support me by smashing that like button, subscribing down below. I hope you have an amazing rest of your day. Peace out.